today, um, speaking of service, um, we are going to have a witness talk, and the, the Ablaze program is a kind of accelerated because we had the uh, kickoff and the praxis in one session, and so today we're going to do our witness talk. And we have the Pierres, Gilbert and Lawrence Pierre, are going to give you the talk, talk about how they've um, brought service into their family, and, and they've uh, done a great job with that. Um, if you don't know, um, Gilbert and Lawrence are both born and raised in Haiti. They met in college in New York City at the City University of New York, and they've been married for 22 years. They've been blessed with two boys, Sebastian and Jonathan, and they're also in process of adopting a little girl from Haiti, and her name is, her name is um, Annie L. Uh, the Pierres have been parishioners at St. Monica's since 2000. They're members of various committees and ministries here at St. Monica's, and they feel that this parish has truly brought them closer to God. So uh, they're, uh, if you haven't seen the, uh, the, P the Pierres, they prepared the food for the Love Boat event. They've helped with hospitality. You know, we see them all over the place. They've done a great job with service to our parish, and we're going to bring up the Pierres just now to give us their program. Thanks, guys. Good morning, everybody. Anybody enjoying their breakfast? Well, there's still more sausage going on and there's more food in the back. They just let me know. So have at it. It's Sunday. We would like to start by asking the Virgin Mary to please take control of this presentation. I ask her to speak for me and uh, for Gilbert and I and for her to help all of us understand the message of the Holy Spirit to each one of us this morning. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hell of our death. I was born in Lekai, Haiti, which is located in the southern part of the island. I grew up, I am the uh, first, the oldest of two siblings. We have, I have uh, two other sisters that are younger than I am. We grew up with an extended family, which, is, uh, which consists of um, my grandmother, uh, my mother and my father, aunts, uncles, cousins. We all grew up together. And it was a party every day. <laughs> I um, also, I was practically raised by the nuns of St. Francis of Assisi in Lekai who resided across the street from our family home. So I had a wonderful childhood, thanks to God, and I always say the Virgin Mary. <laughs> One of my uncles in particular uh, has a lot to do, was very instrumental in um, our entire family being anchored in the Catholic faith. He is um, a retired bishop, Bishop Emeritus Willie Romelus. He truly, well, God has blessed us with him as a bishop in the family to really help keep us solid in the faith. <laughs> I remember accompanying him as we were growing up, as I was between probably the ages of eight and 12, to visit sick families in the um, towns outskirts of the, in the outskirts of Jeremy, which is another city in, um, in Haiti. We rode by car, and some places we would get to the car cannot continue, so we would ride on, uh, continue on donkeys or horses, and these were fun memories for me. I didn't really understand what was going on. I just enjoyed going through the process, and we would visit the sick, visit the homebound. He would bring communion and um, do mass, celebrate mass in the little, small little chapels that are, you know, because Haiti is set up where they, they are major, big churches in the major cities, and then in the small towns, a lot of places, cars cannot arrive, well, it's even difficult for people to get there if you don't have, you know, if you cannot really walk well. So in all those small towns, we would go and um, celebrate mass on the little makeshift chapels that just have a roof over and four pillars, and that was the most, that's really the fun time that I remember um, growing up. 
And then I continued school in Haiti. I did my primary education um, with the Saint Sisters of St. Francis of Assisi in um, Lekai. And then continued uh, in New York. I did my high school years with the sisters, of, the Dominican sisters, Saint Dominic in um, New York. Then I continued to college, and um, that's where I met Gilbert. <laughs> well, again, my name is Gilbert Pierre, also known as uh, Lawrence's husband here. <laughs> I was also born in uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and I completed my primary and secondary school at St. Louis de Gonzague, uh, which is a Catholic school run by the brothers, Les Frères de l'Instruction Chrétienne. I then migrated to New York in the fall of 1987 to attend college. I graduated with a bachelor's in operations management and business. And uh, long story short, met my better half, Lawrence, in college. And we got married in 1994. And we've been blessed so far with two wonderful boys. Um, Sebastian, who's not here, who's actually completing his uh, uh, studies at Pratt University in New York again. And Jonathan, who's 15, who's right here with us. We also cannot forget of adoption going on in process with a young girl that we are trying to adopt. A lot of challenges with the process. Her name is Anael. And she's actually right now in the boarding school in Lekai, exactly where Lawrence was actually raised and actually brought. Same nuns, same school. It is powerful to see it. With that said, um, last week, um, say, Father Jack asked us to talk about the burning desire that made us relentless in love. I have to say the truth, when Father Jack contacted me, I almost wanted to run to Adoration Chapel and then close the door. <laughs> but after pondering with um, Mother Mary, I was able to see exactly the connection and the witness that we are today here to share with you. It is a personal experience uh, that actually started and you can just imagine going to a vacation. Let's go on vacation to Haiti. And during that vacation, boy, were we hit by the Holy Spirit to do his work. And with that said, during that uh, vacation trip, the Holy Spirit gave us our mission in July 2012. Chateau is a small town on the outskirts of Lekai in the southern part of Haiti. That is where my father's family is from. That's where my father was born. We visit every year, uh, well, almost every year. We go back to, to Haiti and visit Chateau. And every time we go there, the kids in the area just gravitate towards our kids, and they come and spend all day, and they play games and sing, and um, it's just, never ends, they never want to go home. So it's, all, it's joyful for them and joyful for us also. And one year, um, my sister, uh, who is a teacher in Gwinnett County, she's actually teaching in Dubai right now, she said that we need to do more because this is just not, not enough. And um, her husband, um, Sergo, and herself decided, let's do a summer camp for just 50 kids. We all agreed, the entire family got on board, and we agreed we're gonna stay at 50 kids. We're gonna do a summer camp. And we started with really the intention of doing 50 kids. We had no clue. We had no idea what we were doing. We just knew there was just an urge. You know, the Holy Spirit, when he's functioning, I've, I realized that he does not give you all the information. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> Because had we known then what we see is happening along the years, we would have ran and said, no, we, can, we can't. <laughs> this is too much. So, so the first year, um, we enrolled. We were ready for about 50 kids to participate in the camp. 
and we actually enrolled 74. It was a huge success. For two weeks, joy filled up the place. And at the end of the first year, we again needed to realize that we needed to do more. And we didn't know what that more looked like. With the small support of the family, friends here in Atlanta, um, we actually left uh, the first year with a program in focusing on education, which we actually, right now, are sponsoring uh, 13 kids that are disadvantaged, disadvantaged, and we are enrolling them in the Catholic school in Chateau. We didn't know how to do it. I didn't have any experiences in nonprofit organization. We didn't know how to run the logistics, overcome the issues that many of us encounter in terms of um, getting this started to where it's at today. But there was one thing that struck us in all that was one word, joy. The smiles, the love that emanated from the kids drove us, like Father Jack would say, ignite that fire to keep us going. We couldn't stop. There was a lot of challenges at the beginning. Transportation, um, I would say, feeding the kids for two weeks, a challenge. Chateau is up elevated in the mountains, which is south side of Haiti. Uh, red tape, bureaucracy, and a lot of other things came up to us to continue what we started. So last summer, the camp has a structure where every morning, uh, well, the first day of the camp, we start with mass. My uncle celebrates mass at the on site for us on the first day of the camp. And this is a picture of the kids walking to camp and playing. They're making rosaries. Um, we, we have different um, activities that um, my sister put together the, where they have, um, they divide into small groups after mass and they, some of them do art and craft, theater, um, what is, there's sewing. always uh, sewing, um, there's a wide variety, there's sports, there is um, speaking about the earth, hygiene, and um, of course snack and a hot lunch. Uh, through all this, it's really, uh, you would have to be there to understand the joy that we receive from thinking, because going into the camp, we thought that we were going to bring joy to the area. We were going to help the kids to, and be happy. And um, what we receive in the end gives us all the, the burning desire, for sure, also makes us realize that the funds, the personal funds that our family puts into this is really nothing compared to what we receive when we thought we were going to be the one giving. <laughs> and um, every evening, all the kids after the camp, the camp usually ends about 3 p.m. After the camp, they all go to my uncle's house. <laughs> And, um, oh, by the way, the camp is held at a school which way back in the 1970s, my father donated a land to the, to the um, government to build a public school. And little do we know now, we had nowhere to do the camp. And this school was available for us to host the camp. So God works in, in funny ways. So at the end of camp, everyone comes to my uncle's house to just be with the kids. And every evening ends with a rosary. And then we have to beg them to go home before it gets too late, because <laughs> there's no electricity. It's pitch dark out there. So they sing all the way home. And then the next morning, they come again. And one morning, it was pouring rain. And we said, we can't have camp today, because it's just, when it rains in Chateau, it just, it really rains. And umbrellas cannot really do anything for you. So we decided we're not. <laughs> We're not having camp today because it's just not possible. Yeah. And then we heard the singing on the road. The kids walked to camp anyway. They just kept singing and they went to the camp in the rain. So we had to go. 
and we, <laughs> and we had camp. So that's the excitement that, that, that it brings. And through this all, there's, um, we're dealing with natural disasters. We have hurricanes. We have um, you know, sicknesses, uh, financial issues, kids who cannot really learn in school. We have educational issues. There's all kinds of issues. But through it all, their faith, it seems to me, just gets stronger with every obstacle that occurs. The kids just get stronger. And I say the kids, I should really say we get stronger because I am a child of Chateau. The only reason I'm not in Chateau and I'm here is because God had a different task for me to accomplish. He had a different plan, a different path for my life. I would say that's why I'm here and not in Chateau. And he placed me in a good school in Haiti, a great Catholic school in Haiti, with the St. Francis, Francis of Assisi uh, nuns, and then with the Dominican nuns in New York. And then he placed me here in this parish to learn and grow more in faith. I always say this parish is such a blessing, and I have no words to express this blessing that God um, placed me amongst all of you here in this parish. And all this, I'm sure he didn't do it for no reason. He has a plan. And that's what gives us that burning desire to do more. And we know that sometimes we don't see how. This year, we don't see how this camp is going to happen because of Hurricane Matthew, the kids are out of their homes. The funds that we already sent for schools and books vanished because the school collapsed in Hurricane Matthews. But when we speak with them, the joy is still there. They have this inner joy that nothing touches. Through all this, they're singing songs of glory to God. When it gets really bad, that's when it seems to me that they're happier. They sing songs of glory to God, they jump, they dance, and they're saying, we know God has a plan because we are his children. He's not gonna just let all of this happen. We know he has a plan. And really that's what I believe, that's the way I was raised, that God always has a plan. Discouragement for us is just a word that doesn't exist. It shouldn't even be in the dictionary because we, we just, we can't afford to be discouraged. It's, it's, it's just not, it's not an option. So with that, that inner joy that I would say poverty instills in us, the word financial poverty instills in us, is just untouchable. No matter what the situation, we are happy because we know that God, he loves us. We are his children, he has a plan. And so he's putting us here this is his plan. He will show us every step of the way what we need to do next because as of right now, we, we don't know. <laughs> we just know that we need to do more. More is needed. And we trust that he will show us. Well, <clears throat> I would do a disfavor if he not, did not point Corinne Ramelis Cavalier, who's not here with us. And she's actually uh, in Dubai. She is burning to hear about this presentation because she's the founder of the foundation, and Joy in Shadow. Mm -hmm. uh, Serge Cavalier, who's not here, and Joy in Shadow, 501c3 organization in the United States. She's the founder of it, and she has spent every summer while she's teaching in Dubai for the past four years, she sacrificed, I would say not only sacrificed, but she goes every year to make the camp happen. And she follows through uh, on a weekly basis, monthly basis with the kids in Chateau, uh, providing them with the books, the education that is needed. And in addition to that, there's something that I wanted to share that's so important and we take for granted. Once a month, she actually have one of the, I would say assistant over there, bake a cake for the kids. And whoever's birthday was on that month, they all come and gather around Bishop Ramallah's house and they all blow the cake. This is so powerful. While we think that when we have a birthday here, the cake is given to us, it's, it's something that is assumed. But imagine most of the kids down there, they don't even know their date of birth. They don't even know how old they are, really. 
to just imagine to light up a cake, that burning desire from that cake is what's keeping us on the monthly, weekly, daily basis. In conclusion, we wanted the camp, we went to the camp thinking it would be great to help the kids of Chateau. We were going to bring joy, playing, laughing, and learning, which is our motto play, laugh, and learn to the community. But in the name of the God, the Holy Spirit really filled us with that fire to continue doing more more and more. The name joy fits. Not only because they enjoy the camp, but because of the inner joy that each one of us have with, within ourselves, regardless of their circumstances. After four years, this camp, we realize it is really the product of the Holy Spirit. We definitely receive more than we have given back. And we would hope this model to continue in different communities everywhere else. We started with, uh, well, we had 13 kids in the sponsorship program. We now have 60. In the, that received the full sponsorship uh, for their tuition, books, and all. And, um, and it's still going to grow because there's a need. And this year, the last year in camp, we had over 200 kids. And um, it was sad that we had to refuse more. It was heartbreaking, but we had to do it. And um, we know God will give us a way this year. And uh, the joy is spreading throughout the small town, waiting for that day for the camp to start. And um, we're looking forward to it. And that burning desire is there and our entire family just can't wait. And we have a lot of great friends that got on board with us also. We have one of them here today. <laughs> and um, that's it. With that being said, um, we wanted to share a video of the kids singing. And you will hear the message within their voice. Thank you so much for your time. <clears throat> All right, that's awesome. I mean, that dramatic key change in there, that great, that's in that beautiful, the, the joy of children is unbelievable, that's great. Um, well, what we do now is, as we always do, we do our uh, table talk, table talk questions. So we're gonna be able to kind of share what you've picked up today and last week and kind of talk about that. Um, the question uh, is, we're going to have one question here. Jesus told Sister Faustina that the greatest obstacles to holiness are discouragement and exaggerated anxiety. What are some ways that you maintain peace through sorrow and suffering and not allow discouragement and anxiety to enter your heart? So we'll take about uh, five or six minutes for that question. Um, just remember, of course, if you're going to 1030 Mass, remember the fast. If you're not, there's leftover food. So let's do this now. Father Jack will give us our send-off. Thank you, Father Jack. I really, I don't need a mic, actually. Um, 
didn't Gilbert and Lawrence do a great job? Wasn't it awesome? You know, and part of that is, um, you know, you wouldn't know about that, right? And so, but there's a lot of work that our parishioners are doing. People who are, they're saying, you know what, we're not waiting uh, for the parish to figure out how to mission where we're from or what, where places we've seen. And so there are a good number of people in our parish who are doing this type of work. What it is is, is they're not waiting uh, for a bishop or a priest uh, to move them into action. They're taking action as a lay faithful is supposed to where they're from and they figure out how to do it. Okay? And, and this is what we're called to do. It, it, we would get over half of our family issues if we just got outside of our family. Okay? Most of the time, we're just so constipated spiritually. I'm, I'm serious, right? That, that what happens is we're just so much about our family issues that we never love outside of our family, and we fail to love within our family. And we've got to get over that, okay? We've got to move. When I talk about a movement of the Holy Spirit, we have got to evangelize. This is the work that we should be doing. And it doesn't depend on Father Jack, a bishop or anybody, giving you an okay. Do it. You see what I'm saying? You're not waiting around. It's like, there's enough things already going on. People are figuring out how to do it. And I, I'm saying like, amen, that's exactly, this is exactly the model the church is talking about. Okay, this is exactly what we're doing. And we won't do it unless we get over our own issues and go out and evangelize. Half the healing of a family could come through getting outside of the family and loving people who are more desperate situations than they are. Most of our healing would come through loving the poor, right? Think of the, think of the blessings it brings to our families, right? And what happens is we get so self-absorbed, so self-focused that that loss makes us very miserable within our own selves. And then we go out to people and we say, wait a minute, I was worried about this within my family. Look how these people are living and they are joyful. You have an earthquake, you have a hurricane, you have no resources, and how do these people respond to it? Quite differently than we do who get upset about the smallest things that happen to us, right? You know, and I look at, I'm looking at myself, okay? So, I just think, just brilliant, beautiful work. And, and what it is, is, as they would say, it's not really our work. It's God's work. It's way ahead of what we could figure out. Which is, you know, you're, when you're in over your head, you know that God's involved. If it's all coming from your head, you know it's about you. Okay, so it's, it's pretty much, I, seriously, right, isn't it? Because once you're in over your head, marriage is basically made for you to get in over your head. Okay, uh, being a parish priest is made for you to get in over your head. But once you get in over your head, you've got to get used to swimming. You're in deep water, okay, and then you figure out how to swim, all right? But that's really, I mean, merely marriage is, it, it, like Lawrence was saying, we would have never started if they showed us what the end, what where we're at right now, you, Right? It's the same with marriage. I would have never started if I knew where I was at right now. You know what I'm saying? Same with parish, you know? So, but the point is, you go, but I wouldn't change where I am right now. I think that's where we show that what the love is there, right? Which is the suffering really has all been worth it. And I'm still here. And I'm still loving. And I still got joy. So this is a beautiful thing. I just, I just love that. Whenever, whenever uh, Lawrence or Gilbert were talking about that, I was just thinking, man, this is, this is beautiful work. This is beautiful work. And I have so many parishioners who are doing things like that. And I think part of the witness is that, for you to see that and just say, okay, you know, wow, they, they're doing that. How did they get started? Well, they said, we don't even know how we got started. We're just describing what's happening in spite of us as much as because of us. Uh, so there you go. We're going to continue to pray and so forth. Next week, we're going to hopefully go out on fire for the summer. Again, this is a, a beautiful way for us. What are we trying to do? We're trying to allow God to work in such a way in our lives that all the normal suffering of the day is just wood on the fire of our restless desire for God. We, we want to make sure that all our suffering is just wood that's increasing and making a fire into a flame. We want to make sure that all the wood of, of potential discouragement and anxiety is changed into a fire of a deeper relentless and restless love. That's what we're looking at, okay? So things that are coming at you are negative. You know, last week I had... I had two gut punches in one day. I was kind of walking around like this. People say, what's wrong with you? I said, I said I, I, if I tell you, I, I, I can't tell you. So. And, uh, but I was thinking about that, you know, in my prayer 
the Lord's just saying, this is just fire to increase your love. You're not going to make it. You're not going to advance without tribulation. And I said, you're right. And then I looked at my, my root sins, and both these issues were dealing with it. I was like saying, Lord, you're, you're good. You're a good surgeon. You're going really deep, and you're ripping out that cancer. Thank you so much. But it's very painful. Could I use a little more anesthesia? No, that's one of your problems. Okay. No anesthesia. Want to get over sensuality. Um, no easy path here once you get over your vanity. That's God. He's very good, right? If you look at where you're suffering the most, you'll probably discover that your root sin is being addressed by it. That God is a master craftsman. That's what I've discovered. I said, like, wow, this really has helped me get over myself. <laughs> yeah. And if you get over yourself, then God can do his work. So I think this examination of conscience, again, was the greatest pain I endure today, the holy desire to love God. The greatest suffering we should go through each day is this reality that we're not completely united to God yet in heaven with a resurrected body. We have to be restless with that desire. And that should be the greatest pain. The greatest pain should not be the issues we're going through. Mental, emotional, or physical suffering. That should not be the greatest pain. The greatest pain is not the full realization of the Father's desire that all be saved through Jesus Christ. That I be completely taken hook, line, and sinker by God. And that everyone else is coming with me. You know? I'm not going down, but I'm going up. And I want you to go up with me. Does that make sense? It, this, is a whole, this is a whole change of view about Christ crucified. Christ crucified, he is not, the physical pain is not the biggest deal. His thirsting for souls is the biggest deal. We got to get to that point, okay? So if you do this examination, I think that's going to help you uh, really. And if I do this examination, help us get refocused. The great thing is what I can see is when I come up with things like this, God puts me through trials to live that examination of conscience. It's like, okay, you're going to put that up on the screen? All right. You're going to challenge your parishioners this way? Let's see if you can live it. Ah. I go, okay, well, that's all right. I, 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 it's not me, but you and me, right? So let's stand, please. And another glorious week coming up in this uh, beautiful season of the resurrection uh, in Jesus. And let us pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And just what a beautiful day. Yesterday we had First Holy Communion. Oh, it's just enough to make you, I mean, uh, just seeing those beautiful kids, those, those wonderful veiled young girls come up and receive, but oh, it kills you. It just destroys you. You can barely keep from weeping uh, for love's sake. It's beautiful. And as we turn to Mary, just think how beautiful she is, the one whose flesh and blood provided the second person of the Trinity, the Son of the Father with flesh and blood, to feed us with his flesh and blood. And so we just turn to her as our spiritual mother, so confident um, that she's interceding with us, that she's helping us carry out the new evangelization and the power of the Holy Spirit that overshadowed her so that Christ could be born to us. And so we turn to her with confidence as together we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out. Thank you, Father Jack. Um, take those... Uh...